Hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Hoping you all are really doing well and taking care of yourself and staying safe. With that said, welcome to our today's episode on the STP training webinar series. The title for our talk today is Quality Focused Software Testing in Critical Infrastructure. Our guest speaker joining us on the webinar is Zoe Owens. I'm Smita Mishra. I'm a tester myself and a sustainability enthusiast too. And I'm excited to host you all and Zoe on our STP webinars. Before we get started with the webinar, let me quickly share an important update that may interest you. There is an upcoming webinar, AI and UI test strategies for intelligent digital ad tech platform. On the 10th of June this year, the speaker is Naga Harini Kodi, who is a QA engineer with Viral Gains. And in this presentation, she's going to talk about testing for dynamic ad tech platform and will review some of the techniques such as machine learning model testing, A-B testing, UI testing, and automating the tests on multiple devices using Selenium. Uh, it sounds like an interesting webinar to me. So the link is up for you to register. Please do go for it. Also, we are inviting proposals for STP webinars from all of you, and this shall be open all year round, so you can submit anytime you're ready. And all the details along with the submission form are at the link given on the screen. Please go through them, and in case you have any recommendations on topics or speakers, do email them to us. We will be happy to hear from you. And if you are on Twitter, please share the conference details and call for papers information uh, with your followers and connections. You can add STP's Twitter handle to your tweets, which is at Software Test Pro. Please do add the hashtag STP webinar to your tweets. And I'm actually looking forward to tweets today. All right, let's get started with the webinar today. Welcome, Zoe. We are very excited to have you with us today. And let me quickly introduce you for all of us here. Zoe is an electrical engineer. She works at Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories in their research and development team as a firmware test engineer, where she applies her knowledge about quality-focused testing into their software development cycle. She has also been giving trainings on automation and quality within her organization and hopes to share her knowledge so others can apply the things she has learned. Now let's start learning quality focused software testing in critical infrastructure. So I'm going to share the screen with her. Thank okay. you so much for the introduction. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you, STP, for the opportunity to uh, present this information. Um, I want to start a little bit uh, but with my background. Um, so I graduated from Eastern Washington University in 2014 with a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. Um, after college, I was hired on here at Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories as a manufacturing test engineer, um, creating automated tests for our manufacturing floor. And then after about a year and a half there, I moved over to R&D, where I then began testing uh, firmware in our uh, devices that are used to protect the power system. Um, and so today I'd really like to talk about um, how to keep that quality focus, um, especially when we're pushed to constantly improve and do testing faster um, and better and all of these things. How, how can we uh, focus on quality? Um, because quality really is the important thing when, um, when our software is protecting lives. So, to begin with, I would like to talk about something that um, a lot of you may have seen. It's called the Iron Triangle um, or the Quality Triangle. Um, essentially, what the Quality Triangle does is it gives us an opportunity to break down quality into three variables that, um, when focused on, can help increase quality or, as a detriment, decrease our quality. Um, the idea being that time, cost, and scope um, are all intertwined in how our the quality of our product is, uh, our total quality ends up being. Um, so if we are to decrease the time in, in the amount of time we have to test, let's say, that would end up decreasing the quality. However, if quality is a fixed point, 
decreasing time means that uh, if we either increase the number of people, the cost, or increase the amount of testing we do, the scope, that we can maintain that same level of quality. This can be thought of uh, in the verb tense using faster, better, and cheaper. Um, so when we're asked to do something faster or to do it with less people, um, knowing these verb tenses and how people use them can really give us a good idea when our quality might be at risk. Um, so I just wanted to make that note here um, that when somebody comes to you and says, can we do it faster? The best response I usually have is, I can do it faster with more people or I can do it faster with better testing. So I wanna talk about each of these individually and first I wanna start with cost. Um, and cost is the thing that we have the least control over. Um, we often don't get to set the budgets on a project. And so when it comes to cost, the biggest impact we can make is really to convince people how important quality is, how important testing is to the overall product. Um, and a lot of times doing that, we can say we've reduced this number of defects. Um, we can hand them metrics, but the biggest impact I've found is actually calculating how much something will cost us if a failure escapes. In critical infrastructure, it can be extremely expensive to our customers as well as the view they have on our products and our quality as a whole if a defect escapes into the field. And so um, coming up with an estimate for that number to say that this defect escape would cost us this much money um, is a good way to get people on board for testing. Um, and I wanna talk about a few metrics uh, that I think are very valuable, um, just a few of them because without tracking the reduced defects, we can't prove any improvements happened. And so it's important to put these metrics into place first before we do improvements to help our quality or improve our quality. Having these metrics, metrics in place really helps us uh, know how, how far we've pushed. Um, the first one being business value del uh, delivered. So, um, Business value delivered is a preemptive metric. It is something that you can um, use to, uh, to convince uh, the approval of an improvement project or something that you want to spend time working on. Essentially, it's a, it's a, a number value for an improvement you would like to put in place that says this will save us this much money over time or this much if uh, every time we run this test will save this many man hours. Um, it's, a, it's a good way to help show the value of an improvement. Um, the next is test satisfaction. This is often overlooked, but within the group, the group is more likely to consider more testing if the tests are trustworthy. If I'm constantly running tests and they fail, but all of those failures are false failures, it's unlikely that I will be asked to run more tests because they will uh, start to not trust the tests that I've put in place. So this is a real-time thing and um, often implemented as a survey. So the way this would work is you'd, you'd send out a survey to everyone within your group that you work with, the people who write code, the people who review tests, and ask them, how do you think our testing is? How do you think the quality of our tests are? Where do you think we can improve? Um, and then you can you can track the satisfaction number and, and kind of show that your value as a tester is improving or not improving based on changes you're making with your communication and other, other hard to track things. The last one I'd like to talk about is um, change failure rate. So change failure rate is a pretty common one, um, but essentially this is actually tracking defects. This is the only one that I'm talking about that's actually tracking defects. But it's important to know how good was your testing. If, if I did a bunch of testing on a product, I wanna know how many defects release into the field. And so CFR is, is basically a percentage of 
how for every release, how many defects do we have? And you want to drive that number as small as possible. So after cost, I want to talk a little bit about scope um, and, and how to basically select how much testing to do, because that is always a difficult decision to make. Unfortunately, we don't have all of the time in the world to do our testing. And even with all of that time, I do not think we could find every defect that exists. I've put this uh, graphic here to kind of describe uh, the scope of testing versus the defects in the product. Um, and as you can see, the more testing you do, the less defects there are. However, that number will never reach zero. And that's just due to the fact that we can't find everything. No matter what, you can't find everything. But we want to do as much testing as we can um, before we start getting those diminishing returns. So to do that, we use, um, whether we know it or not, we use a format called ranking features by criticality. And what this essentially means is within our mind when we're talking about how much should we test something, we have preset decision factors that we use. Um, and then we weigh those factors by importance. And then we evaluate a feature against those factors. Sometimes we do this subconsciously. Um, however, it is good to have an objective way, an explainable, calculatable way to um, figure out how much testing to do. Um, and when I was researching this, I came across something that was pretty interesting, and that was something network engineers use. When putting a device onto a Ethernet network, network engineers use this method called the Kim and Kang method. And the idea is um, they have a bunch of preset decision factors, things like how many, how many people are going to be using this computer, um, how critical is the data on this computer, um, who needs access to the computer. And then they use that, this method to calculate an objective number to determine how much protection to give this computer. And I thought that was a, a, a pretty interesting uh, way to, to classify this and it, it fit pretty well here. So um, I, think it's, I think it could be very useful for test. Um, because essentially it does the same thing. It creates these de decision factors. It gives them a weighted number and it allows us to rank each feature that we're testing for how important it is to test it. So I want to go through an example of how this might work. So in critical infrastructure, our decision factors may be something like this. Um, the first one being safety. Again, I can, I can sum these up with a question. If this feature fails, how dangerous would it be? Uh, it's reach. If this feature fails, how many customers will this affect? The customer effect, basically how many, how many customers will lose trust in our products if this fails? And our complexity, how complex is this feature? And I've given them each a rank based on my specific situation on how important they are. Um, outside of critical infrastructure, maybe safety isn't even a concern, so it wouldn't be a part of the decision factor. But in critical infrastructure, it's the most important. So really, it's team by team how you rank these. And so we can put these numbers into this nice little table here, um, essentially for an imaginary feature that maybe protects, the, protects critical infrastructure. Uh, maybe it protects a high-voltage power line. We have our weighted numbers, and then we give them a rank on zero through five on how important they are um, for this specific feature. Perhaps, so if it's protecting a high voltage power line, its safety is the highest it can be, it's five. Um, maybe it only reaches half the customers. Um, the customers would lose some trust in the product, and the but the complexity of the code itself is pretty simple to implement. You then, adjust the ranks by the weight by multiplying the two together. And then at the end, when you add up all these numbers, you end with this summed number that gives us an objective way to compare it to how much testing should be done. Now, using that number, we can do a couple of things. We could do a tiered testing approach. 
that would be so every time this number is over a certain amount so let's say if it's over five then we do so much testing if it's over 10 we do this much more testing that's kind of the tiered approach and then there's the percent coverage there's lots of coverage calculators for making sure testing coverage is, uh, covers enough and so um, you could do a percent coverage based off of the rank um, compared to the total amount and value uh, possible and use that to come up with a percent coverage you need to meet um, for your code, both of which give an objective comparable way on where it's okay to cut some scope because a GUI interface is important to what the customer sees, sees but is less important to safety. So maybe not as much testing is required there as something that protects critical infrastructure. And isolating those individually and selecting testing based on each, the importance of each is important. Um, the last part of the uh, quality triangle that I wanna talk about at this point is time. And this is gonna be my longest section um, because it's often the point that we're asked to adjust the most and also that we have the most power over. And so when we're talking about time, we really um, need to break down the test process into every piece within it. And then once we've done that, we can, we can talk about specific improvements that can be made there. And I'm also going to talk about some uh, lessons I learned from manufacturing and a little bit about automation, but more specifically the hidden costs of automation um, in its implementation. So the test process, uh, most test processes, um, every test process is different, but most of them look like this. If we put it into a functional block, we have some sort of specification that says, this is how the code should be. And then we have the code and um, the test process is comparing the two and giving ourselves a test result. So if we break that down even further, we can break the test process into four parts, a test write, uh, the test setup, the test execute, and the results creation. Each piece taking in um, different information and using it to compare the specification to the code. The test write, is um, taking that specification and turning it into a command sequence. The setup being anything that does not, uh, that, that is needed before a test can be run. The execute being the actual test being run. And results creation is taking raw results data and making them human readable again so they can be reviewed. But before I talk about each of those individually, I wanna talk about the idea of suppliers and customers. In this process, in every, in every job, there is suppliers and customers. In test, if we're looking at the total test process, our suppliers are the people supplying us with specifications and code, and our customers are the people who have to review our results. We are given um, products to work with, and then we use those products to make our own product, which is a test result. Um, and Throughout this process, you have to have a good understanding and you have to trust the people supplying you with information. And building that is one of the most important things you can do. Um, knowing that the people who supply you with information and the information you supply uh, being what your customers expect is really important. Um, and the other key thing is ownership. The people who own this process, the entire process from start to finish is everyone. Every person owns every single piece of the piece of the process. And once you know that, that's when you can really start to see where things can be improved. So knowing that we can go into our right and look at our input specification, our outputs command sequence. So again, we are taking our specification, turning it into a command sequence. Um, and really when you think about this, I want you to 
what I think about is I have a specific specification which is data formatted human readable. And oftentimes what I do is I take that human readable data and convert it to a test readable data. Um, but in the end, it's just a data conversion. So the biggest improvement I've found in this area of when it comes to test write is if we're testing something simple like buttons. Let's say we're testing some buttons and um, we have a specification given to us for each button. And all of these spec specifications are written by a person in a Word document. And they have the dimensions, they have where the buttons link to, they have the, the text on the button. Um, however, every button should be tested the same. Every button should be tested to the same scrutiny. And to, to do that, automation is a great tool. However, um, a person writing an automated script could write it different than another person writing the automated script. So by automating this conversion of data or making the specification machine readable in the first place allows for that automation to flow smoother and it pretty much eliminates the test write process altogether. It, it allows us to take the specification directly and start running tests on it. The other thing it allows us to do is have time to um, do investigative testing um, in the place of that test write, where we would be spending time doing a test write. Instead, we can be pressing those buttons by hand and trying fun different things that aren't covered by the, the standardized test. And so I've found that this is the most valuable place to put improvement into is is finding these simple repeatable tests things like buttons or or other tests that you have to run a million times and finding where you can work with your suppliers to change the specifications to help eliminate that test write process altogether next we talk about setup setup's hard setup is the hardest one to automate and hardest one to improve um, so for setup, you often need the code and the test, right? You need to know the commands that you're, you're going to be sending and the code, but really what we're trying to do is create a test environment and setting up that test environment so that the test can run properly is difficult and, and doing so a lot of the times, the best thing we can do for a test setup is to have things pre-built, have things set up so that we automatically load code. Um, we, if, if hardware is involved, uh, you have pre-set up stations with, with hardware ready to go. And where that's not possible, um, having things organized and information readily available on how things are organized so that your test setups can be quick and clean and well-known and understood for everyone. Um, that's the best thing we can do for test setups. When it comes to executing the tests, executing the tests is where automation is most often employed. Um, this is the part where we're executing our command sequence and our code and our test environment. Uh, we need our test environment to run our tests on. Um, and this is where we're getting our raw results data. This is the most important part and also the part that we automate the most often. Obviously, automation is an option, and so it's probably already employed. Um, if it is employed, then making sure all of your automation is consistent in how it is executing, in what is what uh, scripts are being used within it, and the way it pulls out results data is incredibly important. Um, and then the other thing you can do is to document that document how the tests are executed, how the automation works. All of that information um, is important to have written down um, to kind of decrease that time of the training time as well as people researching on how things work and whether they work correctly. Documenting that information is incredibly important. Um, lastly is results creation. Um, so this is, this is where we, uh, finalize our product for our customer. So we've created our result data and now we need to output it some way that our reviewer can understand it. And so really the best thing we can do for this is 
if you have automation, a lot of this stuff can be, our results data can be made automatically and often is. Um, and in that case, all we have left to do is be consistent. Um, being consistent to make the job easier on our reviewer is, is really important here because again, we own the entire process. So we own from supplier to customer. And so making work easier on them in turn makes work easier on the entire process. So being consistent in test results and how you format them and what they look like and where they're stored and all of that information, being consistent is important as well as communicating that with them, working with them to find out what works best for your results reviewers. Um, that brings us to, we've talked a bit about automation, about selling automation, how best to sell it. But really there are a lot of things hidden when it comes to automation. A lot of times when you pitch automation, you talk about how, how much time this will save if we do this, how much, uh, how we won't have to run this test by hand anymore. Um, but it's important to remember that when implementing automation, you will be in charge of that automation for life. And so it's important to remember that upfront you have the cost of training. If there's anyone else that has to be producing this automation or using this automation, you have to remember that training is, uh, without training, you will be the only one that knows how this works and you'll be the only one able to run it. Um, and you wanna be able to rely on everyone else in your group as well. Um, no automation is perfect and no automation will last forever. And so there will always be time and money spent maintaining your automation, fixing it or adjusting it for new code, um, debugging things, debugging problems. Um, uh, maintenance is really one of the biggest hidden costs of automation. Um, and then you've got documentation because it's important. Um, without documentation, if you disappear, so does all information on automation. Without documentation, the hidden costs becomes self-training for someone else to figure out how to do it. With documentation, the hidden cost is creating that documentation. But properly documenting code is important for the for the case where you do disappear because you don't want all of your automation work to disappear just because you're no longer with the company or um, anything like that. You want people to be able to understand your automation, learn about your automation without you having to be there hands on with them. And then through this whole process, I wanna talk a little bit about manufacturing. We talked about suppliers and customers in the beginning of this. Suppliers and customers is really an idea out of manufacturing. Uh, the idea that we create a product of some kind in test. And so I wanna talk a bit, a, a bit about um, lessons I learned while in manufacturing. And the first one being listen to experience. When coming up with the place to improve, um, when hopefully you go back and break down your process into individual chunks and you're talking about improving your test rights or your, your test executes, um, it's, it's important to talk to the people working on those individual sections to figure out where the best improvement could be. When I'm helping someone figure out how to, how to improve what they're working on, the first thing I do is ask them, what's the worst part of your job? What do you hate doing the most? Or what do you constantly do? What do you think could be automated? What do you think could be improved? And I do that because somebody working on that product for the last two years is going to have more experience on what could be helped than I could than I could possibly know. And kind of under that same idea is cross-training. In, in manufacturing, everybody on the assembly line um, eventually gets trained on every other uh, position in the assembly line. 
they do this so when people are missing or people are gone or people get sick that they can swap people out move people from one one place to another change tasks quickly and i feel like that is just as important in software development um, and testing to have people uh able to to have people with a vast knowledge base who can uh quickly switch what they're working on place to place to keep the overall process moving. When there, when an issue arises, when we find a bug in the code that needs to be fixed, um, or we're having a problem with the code and need to have better understanding of it, being able to elevate that issue quickly to, to make sure that everybody in the entire process knows what's what the problem is so we can get the problem solved as soon as possible um, because on an assembly line if i have the wrong screws to put in i stop the entire assembly line in test it's the same way if if i can't finish the test right for some reason due to an issue with the spec i need to raise that issue immediately and get it get it uh, closed as soon as possible so we can move on to test execution it's the same thought process everybody along the entire process needs to stop what they're doing and help things moving get moving again because if one step in the process stops, then the entire process will stop for everyone eventually. Once you have elevated these issues, it's important to come to a true resolution, not just fix it for that one issue, but to find why it happened in the first place um, and try and make sure it doesn't happen again um, to, keep, to keep our assembly line of test moving. We have a, we always talk about in SEL, uh, ask why five times. So why did this happen? Okay, this is why that happened. Well, why did that happen? And and you really, the point of that is really to get to the root cause of the issue and figure out how best to fix that. And the last thing um, I learned from manufacturing is well-defined processes. Um, you have to have well-defined processes in place if you want things to run smoothly. And what that looks like might be uh, a design for test for coders so they know the test write is going to go smoother if I implement code in this certain way. Um, if the specification is wrote the, written this way, then I know that the test process will work fine. Uh, things like talking about expectations for what the reviewer will expect, things like that. If, if all of that is well-defined and known by everyone, then it's easier for everyone to come to consensus on what something should look like or how something should function. And so really, what most of what I've talked about for improving time hasn't necessarily been about automation, but more communication. Communicating within your group is the best way to find and implement improvements for decreasing time. To do things faster, a lot of times the holdup and the confusion comes with a not well set up communication paths. Um, so having, having that trust and um, being able to communicate with other people, being able to raise your issues properly, um, all of that is some of the most important um, things you can do. So um, at this point, I, it looks like I talked a little fast and I'm coming to the end uh, a little sooner than I had hoped. Um, but I would like to talk one more time and kind of revisit the quality triangle and why I've broken these out. As, as we talk about each of these, um, I've talked about ways to improve them. And really, the I talked most about time. One point I want to make is if you implement automation and reduce the time it takes to run a test, you're reducing the time it takes to run the test in the future. However, the time you took initially doesn't go away either. So you don't have to have more people testing to keep your quality the same. If you if you make improvements, you can kind of stand on the shoulders of giants and use that initial time as well, because that's that's work that went into reducing that time. And it's it's kind of a, a, a way to cheat the quality triangle. 
as far as all of this information goes, I have some citations here that I'll leave up on the screen for a minute. Um, if you're more interested in manufacturing and how that can be applied to uh, software testing, there's a great book, World Class Manufacturing. Um, everyone in my company swears by it, and I've read it twice now. It's it's great for isolating these things uh, and, and implementing these improvements and figuring out how best to implement those things. And all of the other information is great if you if you want to look more more in depth to a lot of the stuff that I kind of just covered generally here. And I think at this point, I'd like to open it up for any questions. Thank you, Zoe. It was an insightful session. And um, yes, there are questions and I'm going to ask you they, those. But I had uh, one question that I wanted to quickly check with you just to set the context in my mind. I was wondering if, um, uh, so is your team distributed team and uh, are you guys following Agile? Like, uh, could you like describe your stakeholders in the whole testing process in your organization, just to understand? Sure, sure. Uh, within our organization, uh, it it looks like uh, we we usually have software developers, and then we have our test engineers, um, and we are we're in uh, small groups together. Uh, with software developers, power engineers, and test engineers all working closely together in small groups on specific um, product and firmware releases. Um, Great. Yeah. And and as far as Agile goes, we're using Agile, um, but a Kanban system, so more towards the manufacturing side of things. Um, we don't necessarily do sprints. Um, we just have a uh, board of work to be done and as one task gets done we move more work off the backlog and into into process yep totally get that and then yes great so thank you for uh helping me out with uh, that i was just trying to set up now uh, put uh, all that you said into context uh, uh, for your team and that makes a lot of sense now all right um so here are your questions. Let's get started with the first one. It says, on the scope slide, defects versus scope, can you clarify how they are indirectly proportional? Sure. Um, so the idea is no matter how much testing you do, there will always be some kind of defect within the code. Um, I don't know if this is uh, mathematically provable. However, it makes sense um, because what is a defect? Uh, what is 100% done and what does 100% tested mean? Um, there's essentially, you can drive that number down to a point where you won't see defects in the release um, because they won't be found by the customer. It doesn't mean they don't exist in the code, it just means they um, they just won't be found. Um, and if we if we look at that scale, um, I could probably go back up to where that is. If we look at that scale, the first test we do, the first test you do is the most likely thing to find any issues in the code. Um, oftentimes you'll find defects in your code not relating to what you're testing. And that just has to do with the fact that you're doing some testing um, means you're going to find defects. Um, but the point of this slide was to say we we can't we can try to push to zero defects, but there's a point of diminishing return as we um, increase the number of tests we do, um, because all tests have overlap, and all tests will test something they'll. They will continue to test things that we've already tested. And eventually, um, no matter how you test something, it will have been covered. I'll use quotation marks there, covered somewhere. Um, and so we start to see this, these diminishing returns until there's defects in the code that tests can't find. And um, in critical infrastructure, we want to test to the point that we can, we can test as much as we want to test everything we can. 
Uh, great, Zoe. Thank you. I think uh, the follow-up to the same question is that, so it is not the scope of features or requirements, but the amount of testing or the number of test runs. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. When we're talking about the, when I'm talking about the quality triangle here, um, I'm talking about the quality of our testing. Um, and I should have made that more clear. Um, the quality of our testing, though, also directly impacts the quality of our product. So our scope in testing is how much testing do we need to do? All right, great. So we'll move on to the next question. Um, and this one is a quick one, very quickly. Is the approach similar or same as risk-based testing? Um, yes, I, I think it's I think it's very similar to risk-based testing. Um, I haven't done a bunch of research on risk-based testing. Um, however, it seems very similar. Um, most approaches follow this kind of general um, ranking system, whether you intend to or not. Uh, you can break down most of them into the into this box here. Um, and so, this was just another another um, method of doing that. Yeah, um, since I do have some understanding on the risk-based uh, approach, I can say that yes, uh, when you were discussing about the severity of situations or the, the, the probability of users actually seeing the failure and all those different parameters, it does come across like you're trying to gauge a good uh, a range of risks. So yeah, I would think it's very similar to right. risk-based approach. Yeah. Okay, so our next question is, um, with regards to the time cost scope triangle, would you consider automation complexity another dimension? We have found that using deeply architected uh, object-oriented automation instead of uh, basic Selenium scripting allows us to greatly increase quality and scope while also greatly reducing and uh, reducing cost and time. Did, do you want me to repeat because it was a long right. question? Um, um, you cut out in the middle there, but I think I've got the gist. Um, yeah. That kind of goes to when I was wrapping up, I was talking about standing on the shoulder of giants. Um, implementing that um, object-oriented, properly implemented automation is a worthwhile investment to reduce your cost and um, your cost later on for how, for how much time it would take to implement testing. Um, however, you did that work in the first place. And so it still counts on that triangle. Um, you just get to hide it in the money side of things um, because the work was done and so you get, you still get to add that to the sides of your tri triangle to increase your quality. Um, but when you're calculating dollar signs, it it comes out looking a lot nicer. Yes. So, um, so moving on to the next question, what types of testing are recommended for infrastructure? Uh, um, would that be something? Well. Um, it depends on the infrastructure. Um, I can talk specifically about what kind of testing we do. Um, we test um, devices that protect the power system. And so a lot of our, the majority of our testing has to do with the safety side of things. So when I was talking about ranking, um, the what we call protection elements in that actually function in tripping breakers and protecting things. Um, a lot of our, our testing and time goes into making sure that we test those properly. Um, so anything having to do with safety, um, we attempt to test, if, if it's specified, we run a test for it um, to do our best to make sure that we catch any defects. Um, because defects could be costly to our customers, not just not just with um, dollar signs, but with lives. Um, I, however, when we, we when we step to user interface side side of things, um, we don't have to test so thoroughly on how maybe a setting works, 
because it, as long as it's input properly, whether it shows up at the right time doesn't necessarily um, matter quite as much. We still test it to the best of our ability, but as far as it, as far as that goes, we we do a little bit less intense testing for that. Great. All right. Uh, that makes sense. And let me see if we have more questions. Yes, we do. So, as okay, so I think I already know the answer for this, but I'm going to ask this question if you want to add more to it. And the question is um, as you mentioned, you work in small group consisting of developers and testers. Do you test the feature? Uh, do you test feature by feature or do you wait for the entire project to be completed before testing is carried? I think you mentioned Agile and Kanban, but if you want to add something. Yes, yeah, we do uh, We do Agile Kanban. Um, so we test feature by feature as uh, each feature is implemented um, and rolled out. Uh, we do testing on that. Um, as well as once the total release is done, we do a validation testing to make sure that everything works together properly as kind of like that final check. <clears throat> Great. Um, so, okay, the next question is, what are your thoughts for patch installments testing to improvise infrastructure? Testing to patch installments. Uh, um, yeah, we have for patch installments testing to improvise infrastructure. I'm not sure what improvise infrastructure would mean, but uh, I would presume it's uh, more like incremental. Yeah. Um, as far as test, I I'm a big fan of testing as things come out. Um, again, going back to manufacturing. Um, breaking things down to smaller pieces is always good um, and so if if you have enough there to test it's always good to test when you can um, to keep that assembly assembly line moving um, so as something comes in testing it and moving it out um, i from my position is always a good thing sure thank you I okay and uh, here's the next question how do you plan regression testing in manufacturing how do we plan what testing regression testing regression testing in in our manufacturing um for my time that we were there um we didn't necessarily do regression testing um we did we tested every product fully that went through the factory um, and so this might be, again, because it's critical infrastructure, it's important that every product works to the best of our knowledge as we send it out the door. So every every product was tested fully. I know in manufacturing a lot of times um, there might be batch testing or selective testing. Um, as far as regression testing goes, we did do um, some regression testing, but on our automation itself. Um, sometimes taking a, a golden unit, as we'd call them, or a known good unit down to verify our system was working properly is, uh, is an important part of maintenance of test automation. All right. That makes sense. Um, okay. Your next question is, how do you leverage historical testing data to help understand what will be critical for testing in future releases? Sure. Um, again, it's a little bit different uh, from where we are in critical infrastructure um, because it's easy to separate what is super critical versus what's not so critical. Uh, um, however, um, we can see we um, attempt to make our defects very low um, but we have something, some kind, uh, a kind of triable knowledge of fear that we have. And so what we end up doing within our company is kind of building on the existing testing we have. Um, so if, if a protection element has a failure due to some kind of uh, maybe a degrees 
issue. Um, oftentimes, what we'll do is comprehensively add that same kind of test across the board for all future tests. It'll become a standard to check for to make sure that it doesn't get messed up. Essentially, once something becomes, once something arises as an issue, we do our best to make sure that it never arises somewhere else again by um, institutionalizing it as necessary. Yeah, that's a good approach. Um, before I ask you the last question, Zoe, um, I want to ask you something again out of curiosity. Uh, since you are into manufacturing and testing critical infrastructure, uh, could you be doing the typical IQ, OQ, PQ process of installation quality and uh, operational quality, performance quality thing? Um, no, we didn't have any process like that uh, while we were in manufacturing. Um, uh, in fact, and, uh, I'm new to that term. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was. I'm all waiting right. on you. Sorry. All right. All right. So. Uh, do you also have a lot of compliance uh, testing to be done like uh, because of the standards and regulatory mandates yes yeah so we we do our functional testing to make sure things work the way we think and then we have um engineers for for things that have to meet ieee or iec standards um we have automation engineers that go out and do special testing to get uh, to make sure that things comply in, in those factors. Um, so we, we make sure they work the way we think they work, and then it, it moves on beyond us in our functional testing to how, how they match up to the standard. And that does come with some retesting, but that's just kind of the, the cost of, of the situation. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for letting me know that. And that brings us to our last question here. Um, the question is, you mentioned making quality a team focus. What is your process to understanding the definition that team members have of quality? Um, well, I'm lucky in SEL, um, I, I can't go a week without hearing everyone owns quality. Um, but my my definition of you know everybody knowing what quality is is um, <clears throat> quality should be the first thing on everyone's mind when it comes to a release, not how much something costs or when it's released. And if you hit that point, you know that um, your team truly is focused on quality. Um, I, as as long as quality is the first thing on their mind, then I think you're on the on the right track. Great. That answered well, the question, or did I get off a little bit? No, no, no. You did you you did perfectly well. You you answered it perfectly well. So, and with that, uh, I think we've come to the end of our webinar here. It was a very insightful session, Zoe. So thank you so much. Uh, awesome. Thank, thank you for, you for the. Thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, and thank you for sharing all the details. I'm sure it helped a lot of our attendees and they found it to be informative and useful. Uh, thank you again, Zoe. And uh, I enjoyed your presentation. Look forward to more with you. Awesome. Thank you. Well, everyone, this concludes our webinar for today. Thanks for joining in and more importantly, thank you for being engaging, asking questions and following, following up uh, on those questions. Uh, that actually uh, you made the most of the webinar for yourself and also for the whole group. So thank you. Stay tuned for more webinars uh, at softwaretestpro.com. We have an upcoming webinar, which is AI and UI test strategies for intelligent dig digital ad tech platform on the 10th of June, 2020. Uh, the speaker is Naga Harini Kodi, who is a QA engineer at Viral Gains. And in this presentation, Naga Harini will talk about uh, different testing techniques for a dynamic ad tech platform. 
uh, if the subject interests you, please do sign up for the same at softwaretestpro.com. Also, before I leave, let me again remind you, the call for submissions for the webinars is open and will remain open all year round. Please do send in your proposals at the given link. Well, thank you everyone. Please stay healthy and safe and practice social distancing and good luck for all you too.